we're here today with uh, Byron Dieter uh, of Bessemer Venture Partners, and I'm Don Keller with Oric, and uh, we're interviewing Byron and, and uh, wanted to get his views on the market. So, uh, Byron, just to start off, um, what what uh, areas are you and, and Bessemer focusing on these days in terms of investment opportunities? Sure. So, as a global fund, we are looking in all areas hyper growth tech. I would say uh, our particular areas of, of highest activity would tend to cluster around software broadly defined, which is really cloud computing today, uh, mobile, consumer internet, and then we are active still in life sciences, clean tech, a number of the sectors that sort of go in and out of favor perhaps for some other firms, uh, but we do continue to believe innovation is happening there. Personally, I head up our cloud practice globally, so that's my primary area of focus, and then I also do internet infrastructure investing. Uh, with some ad tech elements and some uh, plumbing elements uh, there and, and continue to be excited about innovation uh, on the internet side as well. And are there any particular areas within what you just described that, that you're waiting for the perfect company to come along? Uh, we have a road mapping process internally, so I, I won't uh, call out the specific shots that we're looking for, but I will say, for instance, in the cloud stack, uh, if you think of it in the traditional three layers of the software as a service on the application side, the platform as a service layer, and the infrastructure as a service layer, We've tended to be very cautious on the infrastructure as a service layer, and I think will remain so. Our general view is that's the domain of, of the big boys. They're, uh, fortunately for our entrepreneurs, they're forward pricing and, and driving the commoditization of that layer. So we don't necessarily think that's a, a venture market or a new entrepreneur's market in the same way that we think the other two layers are. And so we've been quite active historically in the software as a service layer and have been fortunate to work with a number of the leaders there, including Cornerstone on Demand, which is, uh, I think, still the fastest growing pure play public SaaS company, and Eloqua, which is on file to go public, and a number of others. Uh, in the platform layer, which I think we're starting, I know we're starting to do more of, and I think is, is uh, equally interesting, we've been working with companies, uh, an IPO last year, Broadsoft, which is one of the, the first IPOs in that true world, but increasingly companies like Ascendgrid or a Twilio or a Box, where they are enabling. Uh, API access for application developers and really writing the benefit of the commoditization of the infrastructure layer and this proliferation of applications and, and uh, sort of benefiting from both trends. That sounds great. Um, how would you describe one of your most interesting recent investments? Uh, so, you know, we love all the, all the kids equally, yeah. uh, so to speak. <laughs> uh, so it's hard to pick a favorite, but maybe just to double click on that platform layer, uh, comment a little bit. I think in the case where you have this uh, developer wave, we think that we talk about developer citizenry internally where developers are driving the, a lot of the decisions where a lot of the uh, early tech adoption curve and a lot of the innovation is happening within large companies and net new businesses where they're, they're going out doing the research, finding products that are compelling and so we think there'll be a lot more opportunity there and, and when you look at a company like a Twilio in the telephony space, you've got this massive multi-hundred billion dollar market that has really been slow to innovate and has been uh, traditionally, extremely hard just to get a business deal in place, nonetheless, technically, to, to benefit from the services uh, if you're an application developer or an enterprise. And so the opportunity to turn that market on its head and say, you know, pay by the drink. These were a lot of ex-Amazon Web Services team members, so they understand the, the notion of take friction out of the process. Uh, I want to you know, purchase by the minute or by the you know, transaction and uh, really have no friction up front to the enablement. And SendGrid's doing the same for email and Box for collaboration. And uh, we're fortunate to be investors in LinkedIn, and they've done it on the consumer side. Uh, we think of it for the uh, work network, but for recruiting and sales and biz dev, same thing, where you can get value, you can start to work with it very easily, and then work your way up. And, and those models, we think, are extremely compelling. Great. And how do, how do, how do companies find you? Uh, or do you find them? Are, are, you, are you outwardly looking, or, or what, how does that work? Uh, so. Yes and yes, in the sense that uh, outwardly looking and they, um, and they find us. The best companies are always in demand. And so even though, in theory, uh, giving away money should be easy, uh, we find that uh, oftentimes we are uh, really working hard to develop a long-term relationship with entrepreneurs, show value early in, in the relationship so that uh, this kind of two-way marriage can, can be built up over time. And so... It always helps if there's trusted referral points, if people know uh, our trusted advisors uh, on, on the legal side, on the uh, finance side, or uh, former executives that we've worked with. 
that takes out several steps in just reference checking and validation for us that, that really does help to, to streamline things. And then in particular sectors where we're outbound, uh, in cloud computing that's fairly broad today, but certainly in the top two layers of the stack, uh, we, we absolutely look for companies that are disruptive and making waves in the market wherever in the world they may be. We've got offices around the globe. And so unfortunately, uh, although I'd like it if all the innovation happened you know, 10 miles within uh, north or south of my house, uh, that's no longer the case. And so wherever in the world literally these companies are, we, we try to find them. And if they can't find us, we, we hope that we're visionary enough and proactive enough to track them down. And what are some things that really impress you separate from the, the, the nature of the space or the idea, but impress you about the way the entrepreneur approaches you or presents their material, or what, what are some tips you can provide? Uh, so it's funny, the, uh, I once used, unsuccessfully I might add, the Charlie Sheen analogy, so I, I probably, that was the first thing that popped in my mind, so I'm going to try it again, but uh, people made fun of him, his, you know, his winning notion, his tiger blood uh, comments. But really those two things capture, which for us, it's, it's tenacity, it's, it's that tiger blood <laughs> instinct of, run through walls to get things done. And it's the winning notion of, of pattern of success. Uh, we don't care as much what you've done before. It, it could be you know, literally success in, in the arts or science or something that, that's tangential to the core business. Obviously, it's helpful if it's relevant. Mm -hmm. But just a pattern of success in what the individuals have done before. Academic success, um, you know, military success, just uh, that combination of run through walls because startups are hard and I know how to be successful and I'll work hard to be successful. Those two elements are just, they're hard to learn and people either have them or they don't. And then a lot of the other things, you can learn markets, you can, you can build teams, et cetera, but without those, I think, necessary but not sufficient conditions, it's really hard. That's great. Now on the opposite side, what are some things that you see people do that are just wrong in terms of trying to make progress on, on getting money? Well, on the financing front, uh, two things probably pop to mind. One of them is self-serving, so I'll flag that up front, but I think it's true, and I, and I will say I executed this way when I was a, a founder and a CEO, and so I, I did at, carry this out in action, but I think a lot of the times people incorrectly focus just on top pegging valuation. And they'll, they'll look at investors, they'll look at term sheets as um, really the, the valuation is the primary metric, and then they, every, the other discussions fall out. And you wouldn't hire an employee that way. You don't start with the offer package and then um, decide who you're going to hire based on you know, who, the, in that case, the, the cheapest resource is. And you certainly shouldn't pick an investing partner and a long-term you know, valuable member of the board, hopefully, and a, a collaborator in the room with you on that basis. And as an entrepreneur, I, we literally took a term sheet that was uh, from Bessemer that was half the valuation of another investor who was just very desperate to get in the deal, and, and we never regretted it. Bessemer paid for themselves so many ways over because the financing isn't a sales point. It's n you're not... You're not selling the business, at which case you absolutely should make the rational argument to right. top peg right. the valuation uh, in the vast majority of cases. You're looking to, to create value and change the slope of your line. And if a partner can come in through capital and other things and change the slope of your line, then they will pay for themselves very quickly and many times over. Um, and then the other thing just related to that I'd say is thinking about the rate and pace of investment and how much to raise. I think there's been huge positive movement there recently where the cost of, of starting a business has come down so much that people don't need these big rounds anymore early on and that friends and family can get you to a product and get you to a launch. And as a former entrepreneur, um, I wish we were in this wave where we could have done that. We, we had to go out and buy Sun Hardware and Oracle databases and right. build a sales force and it took 10 million bucks before we knew if it worked. Uh, that's no longer the case. And I think that entrepreneurs now have the advantage to raise smaller rounds, do it more selectively and really build value so that you can own more of your business in the end, and from our perspective, you know, venture capital is expensive, and so uh, it's dilutive, and so we can come in at the right point, add that rocket fuel at the right time, and, and really get you know, the win for us as well. Does that mean you're really not looking for companies at the uh, uh, inception or idea stage, or, is that, or, or would they have to be a team that you've worked with in the past? Is that, is yeah, so we look at all stages, so it certainly don't want to make any blanket statement. Uh, for that raw idea stage, the, the team has to be exceptional, and one of the ways we know they're exceptional is if we've worked with them before and have the benefit of seeing that. So that makes it a lot easier. Um, it's hard. The references and the idea have to be extremely compelling if we haven't worked with them before to do that raw you know, PowerPoint and you know, two people. But those are fun deals to do, and I, and I love to find deals like that where it's just this, it's wide open, there's running room, we can jump in this together, and, and that, those are great when you find them. But 
what often happens is you, you meet those teams, you start the dialogue, but you, you say, you know, I just, because we don't have the history or because we don't yet have conviction on the market in the same way, let's start, get to know each other. Maybe an angel round's more appropriate early on. Maybe, you know, we even have to stand down and let another venture firm be the early partner. But we hope to still be able to add enough value and, and keep enough of a relationship where we'll have, we'll have the chance when they do have metrics and when there is uh, some customer adoption where then we can still have the discussion. And it still makes sense for a lot of businesses to raise you know, downstream capital when they're having some success. And, and there's you know, several cases where we weren't visionary enough to bet early on and, and come to uh, you know, a rational agreement with the entrepreneur up front. But we, we've been able to pay for our mistake and, and uh, pay up and, and give the entrepreneur the benefit of, of uh, an increase in valuation to still be involved. And, and many of those have, have proven to be some of our best deals and best relationships with the teams. That's great. So your personal background, did you set out to be a venture capitalist when you graduated from college? Or, or was that something you thought about? Or just you just ended up there after being an entrepreneur? Uh, I, I can honestly say I, I had no idea what venture capital was through school. So shame on me for that. But I certainly didn't uh, set that out as an aspiration. Uh, much worse than that, I, I went into consulting uh, coming out of school. So I did the tour of duty at McKinsey, think very highly of them, but uh, quickly realized that my type A hyper-aggressive personality wasn't a fit for that. And so uh, I did find my way into venture and, and worked a little bit there. Um, jumped over to the entrepreneurial side uh, and had a, an absolute blast uh, in the early days of cloud computing back when uh, the ASP and on-demand terms were just being coined. and by virtue of having uh, some shared success there and, and making our investors some good money and, and having more exposure to the venture community, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to, to come back over uh, and, and lead a practice area and be a partner with Bessemer. But uh, venture is a hard job to apply for, and, and you really need to get a sense for if it's right for the personality type, et cetera. And so I think even though my path wasn't purposeful, I think that tends to often be the path that people find their way in, which is you get enough exposure to it to know whether or not it's something that, that would be exciting and a right. fit. And if you weren't a venture capitalist, what would you like to be doing? Uh, I'd be back on the entrepreneurial side. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just love that team dynamic, being in the room, you know, kind of taking the hill. And I try to get that fixed vicariously through our companies. And uh, you know, it, it's always a problem if we're, if we're taking operational roles or too involved. And so I also need to be respectful of, of our companies. And, and when we walk out of the board meeting, other than the, uh, the phone calls I get to have and the side meetings and those things, uh, we, we need to let the teams run the business, and, and they're much better at it. But um, I, do, uh, I do absolutely uh, share the passion for innovation and uh, just love the, the fabric of the valley where uh, teams are, are able to, to go out every day trying to change the world, and, and that's infectious. So uh, if, uh, if at any point uh, you see me abandoning venture or getting kicked out of venture, then we'll uh, the that, that's probably side. where I'll be. Well, Byron, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, that was terrific discussion. I appreciate uh, your insights, and uh, thank you. Thank you. appreciate your continued support as well.